I want to tell the story of an incredible adventurer who brought Scotland, Japan and Canadian and American first and later nations together. If that sounds like a tall order, then come with me and find out. So if you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. In 1848, Japan had been closed to the world in self-imposed isolation for over 200 years. Now, all that was going to change when American Commodore Matthew Perry sailed into Tokyo Bay informing Japanese authorities that he would be back in a year to conclude a trade deal with Japan, whether they liked it or not. But you'd be amazed at how much of the change that was about to come was affected by Scots, and today I want to tell you about one in particular. When this bolshy American Commodore turned up with his gunboat diplomacy, how did this closed country even communicate with the English-speaking world? Let me tell you about Ranald MacDonald. Ranald was born at Fort Astoria in the Pacific Northwest. Now, depending on whether you believe the Hudson Bay Company or the American Pacific Fur Company, some might claim him as American or Canadian. But he was born in a trading post with a multicultural mix. His dad was Scottish and his mum was local First Nations Chinook. Now she died shortly after he was born. So at first, he was looked after by her family, then his dad's Metai's second wife. He was brought up and educated in various Hudson Bay trading posts as dad moved around, but mainly at Red River Colony, Manitoba. After that, it was on to train as a banker under one of his dad's pals in St. Thomas in Upper Canada. But he wanted to go to Japan. Nobody went to Japan. Apparently, when he was a boy, three Japanese sailors were shipwrecked and brought to Fort Vancouver around the time that he'd been there. Now, there's debate as to whether he was actually there at the time or he'd already left for Red River School. There's debate as to whether this motivated him to his deep interest in Japan. Was it that he wondered whether they were the closest relatives to the ancestors of his Native American forebears who'd migrated across the Bering Straits. Whatever the answer to these questions, he set his mind to go to Japan. But how to do it? It was closed to the outside world, and a visit to their shores could result in imprisonment or death. There's a decision to be made. Death work as a bank clerk, death, work as a bank clerk, death, work as a bank clerk, death, work as a bank clerk. In 1841, he broke out of the bank and headed off to sea. In 1845, he signed on as crew in a whaling ship called Plymouth. In 1848, he set out on a hunt from Hawaii and he persuaded the ship's captain to put him to sea on a little boat off the coast of this island, Hokkaido. Are you mental? Do you know the punishment for folks landing in Japan? Hokkaido here is the island at the northern end of the Japanese archipelago. It's freezing. It's where I am now. In his autobiography, MacDonald said, my plan was to present myself as a castaway and to rely on their humanity. What? Didn't you see the film Bridge Over the River Kwai or Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence? What about the TV show Tenko? Am I showing my age? He said, my purpose was to learn of them and if occasion should offer, to instruct them of us. Well, it's up to you, mate, but I think you're taking a risk. I know some of you are thinking, What's so difficult? If I was called Ronald McDonald and I wanted to get into Japan, I'd just dress up as a clown and sell them hamburgers. In fact, in Japan, the burger clown is called Donald McDonald. You see, they already had a famous Ronald McDonald. Our 
our guy. On the 1st of July, 1848, he came ashore on one of the smaller islands here off Hokkaido. It's called Rashiri Island. It's, it's out there somewhere. He pretended that he'd been shipwrecked and a bunch of locals took him to the daimo of Matsumi. That's one of the clans. Anyway, he's their feudal overlord and they sent him to Nagasaki. Obviously now I'm off to Nagasaki, but I'm also going to be in Dunedin at the Fringe Festival. There's still some tickets available for my show, Stories of Scotland. I've also put on additional shows in Auckland, Cairns, in Hobart, Tasmania, and I've put on a second show due to demand in Melbourne. So get your ticket links in the description below. Nagasaki was the only place that Westerners were known of. In fact, it was the only place that they were allowed to be, as this was the only place where the Japanese carried out limited trading with the Dutch. So they held MacDonald under house arrest at a temple here in Nagasaki. But the Japanese had been aware of American and British whaling ships entering the waters around their coastline. So since nobody in Japan could speak proper English, they sent 14 samurai to learn English from a Scottish Native American. Now you see why the Japanese talk funny. He spent 10 months cooped up teaching English to these guys. Now, one of them was a bit of a genius with languages. His name was Moriyama Ainosuke. They didn't know it at the time. But the 10 months spent learning English from this Scottish Native American meant that when Commander Perry arrived off the shores of Japan five years later, Moriyama Ainosuke was conversant enough in English to be heavily involved with the negotiations. Samuel Wells Williams, the American missionary and linguist who travelled with the Perry expedition, said of Ainosuke, a new and superior interpreter came named Moriyama Yenosuke. He speaks English well enough to render any other interpreter unnecessary, and this will assist our intercourse greatly. He asked if Ronald MacDonald was well or if we knew him, giving us all a good impression of his education and breeding. Ainosuke was also one of the players involved in negotiation of the Treaty of Yedu with the British five years later. Negotiating on the British side was the Earl of Elgin, a direct descendant of Robert the Bruce. No wonder they understood each other. Now, Ranald MacDonald is probably a name that nobody in Scotland's ever heard of. But here in Nagasaki today, there's this monument to the Scotsman who first taught Japan to speak English in 1848. Donald McDonald, well, eventually he did bring hamburgers to Japan, but that's another story. If you'd like more stories about Scots who impacted Japan, then there's a video coming up on screen now. Support the channel by clicking the link to become a Patreon member or buy me a coffee in the description below. In the meantime, Hamian Dog is going to be a lamb at life. Cheerio and Rasta.